Good evening. <clears throat> okay. Um, well, in case you're always wondering why I'm filming in a truck, I'm at work at the moment. Where I work, uh, I work way out in the bush, so I go away to work for two, three weeks at a time, and I, I kind of live here, so at the camp I stay at, uh, sitting in the truck is pretty much my best chance to have privacy um, and not offend anyone with my subject matter, I guess. So, tonight's video is going to be entitled Psychedelics, Shamans, and Social Responsibility. So we'll start with the first header, I guess. Psychedelics. Um, psychedelics as an actual tangible substance or plant or psychedelics as uh, an experience. Um, there are ways to reach psychedelic states, I guess, or visionary states other than the ingestion of plants or chemicals. Um, uh, breathing, meditation, sweat lodges, uh, anything. Yeah, there's, there's all kinds of different ways besides ingesting something. <coughs> So, psychedelics themselves, uh, salvia, San Pedro, uh, peyote, um, any manner of mushrooms, uh, aboga, DMT. So, psychedelics themselves. Psychedelics. I mean, there is there's a there's a revival now, and there's a, a movement underway. The you know people are trying to pr promote psychedelics and psychedelic exploration as a way to break free of um, culture, as a way to break free from. Uh, just the models of society that we've uh, we've we've worked our way into over the centuries, which which are being shown to fall short, you know, in any number of ways. People are sick, people are hurt, people are afraid, and they're looking for an answer. Now, mind you, psychedelics can do a lot to expand your mind and your consciousness and really open up a venue to to make one think about what it is and why that we do and why we do it it makes you ask questions it makes you question the systems of control that you've been placed under and you know however consciously take part in every day Now, I know that the proponents of this movement are trying to do good work. They want people to be free. They want people to know about these, these plants and these substances. Um, for the purposes of my videos, I'm only going to be speaking about plant-based uh, psychedelics and hallucinogens because uh, I don't do chemicals myself. That's not to say uh, discredit chemicals in any way. Uh, I think they can be, you know, very powerful exploration tools. It's just something I don't like to do myself. I've had bad luck with that. It's a part of my life I, I've put to rest. So, we have this movement underway. This, uh, this revival in uh, psychedelics and hallucinogens. Um, people really want to promote them. People want to share with you the experience and the freedom and, and the joy that they have found in them. And they don't, however, you know, pure their intentions are, um, they don't really want to mention all the negative aspects of it. Now the media, they love to, they love to uh, dramatize stories about psychedelics 
and they they love to scare you. They like to keep you in fear. So of course, on the five o'clock news, they're going to you know stay tuned. This new killer drug is sweeping our high schools. Blah blah blah. This is what we must do about it. We have to protect the children. <laughs> Uh, now the folks who are promoting psychedelics, of course, they you know they know that it gets enough of, of uh, psychedelics and hallucinogens get enough negative press. Um, let alone you know just fake you know just foolishness that gets said about it. I seen one news report where they said kratom is an extremely addictive substance. Uh, there's one woman claimed that at a cava bar, she tried kratom and became addicted to it, and it, it you know like she it nearly ruined her life. If you can get addicted to kratom, or kratom, however you want to say it, you can get addicted to chewing bubble gum. That's not the plant's fault. Some people are just well stupid and prone to addiction. <sighs> I can understand why people who who promote psychedelic exploration would want to list off the negative points. I, I get it. But you kinda have to. You can't just rely on people's intuition. You can't rely on the fact that everyone's just gonna go out after they hear you speak about psychedelics and do a ton of reading and research and protect themselves. So, okay, shamans. Now this ties into psychedelics. The big psychedelic I want to talk about is DMT, mainly ayahuasca. Ayahuasca is exploding, it's getting huge. Everyone wants to do ayahuasca. The only problem with that is, well, there's a number of problems. First problem is the Peruvian ayahuasca tourist trade. And that's what it is. It's a trade. It's a business. It's developed into a cash grab. Um, just because somebody speaks all magical and mystical and claims to want to heal you doesn't mean they have pure intentions. Um, well, you just got to look at the history of ayahuasca itself before the last 20 years when, you know, people started going down there in droves uh, to go to these, these centers and, and take ayahuasca. You know, okay, ayahuasca is a powerful medicine. Ayahuasca was used for healing, but in extreme cases. It's not like a couple thousand years ago, everyone and every single person in the village was taking ayahuasca. It wasn't. Mostly, it was just the shaman. So now you have a bunch of white folks who go down to Peru, set up shop where you can operate for next to no overhead. You don't have any operating costs for these centers. Um, in a place where you could live like very comfortably for twenty thousand dollars a year. These people are opening up centers and charging people a thousand to two thousand dollars for a week. Um, and what are they paying for? Uh, they're paying for something, plants that grow in the jungle. So let's say you could live for 20,000, one person could live for $20,000 a year comfortably in Peru. Um, let's say you get six people a week going to your center. That's $6,000 a week. That's $72,000 a year. So these white folks are going down to Peru, opening up ayahuasca centers, and they are getting rich. All these folks who got these videos on YouTube and, and they go on about how, how you know, uh, how they try to act like they're all holier than thou, like they're these hippie mystic shamans who are just here to help the people. Yeah, they don't mention the fact that they're getting rich doing it. And they also don't mention that very little of this money is going to the locals because once you get a taste of that cash you tend to get greedy <sighs> so let's discuss shamans in a little bit more detail not everyone is meant or designed to be a shaman not everyone who takes ayahuasca is a shaman 
Shamans are healers. Um, certain people are just predisposed to this. Just like some people uh, have perfect pitch. Some people are just good singers. Some people are just good mountain climbers. Some people are just meant to do certain things. It's just in their nature to be good at it. <clears throat> Not everyone can be a shaman or is meant to be a shaman. Um, and the definition of what shamanism is, I mean, shamanism is practiced around the world, and shamanism means to cross over, to go to the other side, to be a medium. Um, now, in the last few years, and of course all these scam artists who are running these Peruvian ayahuasca centers, they won't tell you the difference. They won't tell you the truth or the legacy of shamanism. Um, shaman, being a shaman is not a, a really 100% a pleasant thing. You know, back in the day, each, each village or tribe or community, they had a shaman or a healer. And while they, they revered that person, uh, you know, while they held them in, in high regard, they also kind of shunned them. Most often, the shaman lived outside the village in their own little space. Because... Uh, they respected them, but they also feared them. Because what the shaman did, crossing over to the other side, entering into these altered states, uh, it scared people. So, basically, the shaman would put themselves in harm way to solve the community's problems. If someone was sick, the shaman would enter into a visionary state and seek answers from, from either spirits or ancestors or other beings or entities on the other side. And they took on a great deal uh, of, of risk to themselves to do this. And when crossing over to the other side, uh, it's, it's not safe. It's pretty dangerous. There are a lot of wrong turns that can be taken. Now I've heard, I've been hearing a lot more about people who have taken ayahuasca and gone too far. So they go too far into the other side. When, when you're exploring on the other side, you can see a lot. You can learn a lot. The, the, you know, the spirits or the entities or the dead on the other side will share quite a bit with you. Um, but there are lines that can be crossed. As a living being, there are things that are not meant to be known by us. Um, there are lines that you can cross. The, uh, there are things you can see and learn and know on the other side that aren't meant to be known by the living. And I'm, uh, <clears throat> I'm a firm believer in the fact, because I, I've been there so many times before, that if you go too far into a visionary state, you could think yourself into non-existence. You could forfeit life altogether if you go too far and see too much. You could just lose yourself in it and never come back. But then you could also just go a little too far and come back. Now, when you cross over, if you go to the other side, you interact with these beings or, or entities, whatever you want to call them, uh, ancestors, the dead, spirits, um, usually, in my experience, uh, spirits on the other side are pretty good about warning you and letting you know when you are about to cross over a line that the living are allowed past. You know, I've, I've had experiences before when I've been, um, 
I'd be hanging out with with spirits, and they we 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 we'd talk and we'd share ideas and whatever, and then we'd come to a point, and they would say, "Hey, where we go, you can't follow." But sometimes things get confused. And I think that if you go too far into the other side, you could, when you come back, you could know things, even if you're not conscious, if you, even if you don't consciously remember them, you could go too far and bring back things with you that, that aren't meant to be here. Now, in those circumstances, when you've, you've crossed over a little too far, and, and you bring something back with you. Now you imagine when we, the living, cross over, how completely foreign that other place is to our consciousness and our perception of reality. Now you imagine you take a spirit or an entity from that other side and half drag them back here with you. Can you imagine how foreign and, and confusing a, a physical existence would be for an entity that is used to existing over there, or for a spirit, or a ghost, or the dead who have been on that side and, and maybe lost all memory of this flesh-bound existence, it would be pretty terrifying and confusing. So I'm reading a lot and I'm hearing a lot of, of people tell me lately about these ayahuasca experiences where they did go too far and they've come back and they don't feel right again anymore. They, uh, they come back and they feel like reality isn't real, like things around them aren't real. It's like simulation theory. Um, the, the world's a little less colorful. Uh, uh, they still have horrible visions in their dreams. Now, I've always managed to, you know, hey, that's another thing, too. Not everyone's meant to be a shaman. And not everyone is meant to take psychedelics or hallucinogens. Shaman, there was usually only one, maybe two shaman in a community, a village, whatever. And that's for a reason, because not everyone's mind is designed to handle that kind of trauma. <laughs> it's, it's not easy to navigate around those spaces. Not everyone's mind is set up to work like that. Myself... Um, I've had experiences when I crossed over, I seen horrible, horrible things. Like things that would put most people in an institution for the rest of their life. You'd be in a padded room hugging yourself. But, myself, I see these horrible things coming at me. I see, you know, I see, uh, I see a 10 million year old demon swooping down on me, screaming a thousand evils in my face, and I laugh at it. Some people just can't handle that. Some people buckle, and they come back and they're damaged. Myself, I, no matter what the other side throws at me, uh, I know that I can handle it. <sighs> because certain people are just like that. Certain people can, I don't know how to say it. Um, certain people's minds are just designed to deal with things like that. To navigate those, those, those spaces. Um, that's why I recommend, uh for anyone who's thinking about maybe getting into this to try salvia first because it's very it's hard it's fast it's very chaotic and it's very short-lived um, it'll be over with quickly and if that terrifies you at least you're only going to be terrified for five minutes and you'll know there and then if it's something you can handle Um, but it's, cha yeah, it's chaotic to the point that you don't really get to, uh, you don't get to linger in one space for too long or ask too many questions. 
it just bombards you, your mind, with, you know, with a million different ideas all at once. Not everybody is meant to be a shaman. Not everyone's mind is designed to handle psychedelics. But that's one thing these Peruvian ayahuasca scammers aren't going to tell you. They're going to take as many people down there as they can, dose the fuck out of them without any concern about who they're damaging. Because by the time you realize that there's been some damage done, you're going to be back in the States. You're going to be back in Canada. You're going to be back wherever you're, wherever you're from. And yeah, you're out of their hair. So why the fuck should they care? And what are you going to do? Sue them? You flew to the middle of the fucking jungle and drank some shit that some guy brewed up and who can't even speak English. That's that's going to be a great lawsuit. Yeah. Um It's I know there's a lot of romanticism right now about the idea of shamanism and everyone wants to be one. But Everyone wants to do it the easy way. Everyone just wants to go down to the jungle, take a little shot glass full of jungle juice, and then bam, you're a shaman. There, are, there is so much more to it than just taking psychedelics or hallucinogens. You have to be just predisposed to helping people, to being a healer. Um... You don't have to take psychedelics just to talk your friends through their problems. That's, that's not what it's about. You have to know how to heal people. Just in conversation, just by, just by being a shoulder to cry on, an ear to listen. You need to know how to heal people with plants, with kindness. You need to know how to heal people with, you know, by just telling them the way it is. If your friend is doing something stupid and self-destructive, you have to have the courage and the will to tell them flat out, Hey, you're being a fucking idiot, smarten up. Shamanism is such a selfless thing. You have to, you know, have little concern for yourself in helping others. There are a lot of sacrifices to be made. There's a lot more to it than just getting high. If there is a severe enough problem in your life or in the life of the, one, of the ones that you care about that you can't get a solution to, when you've exhausted your options, you enter into a visionary state. You cross over. You seek answers from your ancestors, from the dead. And I'm pretty sure that these spirits on the other side aren't really taking too kindly to the wave of tourists that have been visiting them. <laughs> but if you're a person who has found themselves damaged by this, I wouldn't look to medicine to fix this problem. If I were you, and you think you might have gone too far, you might have crossed some boundaries, gone to some places you shouldn't have been, and it's left you damaged. If I were you, I would make an offering to the spirits on the other side, to the dead, to the ghosts, the entities, whatever the hell. Uh, I would make an offering to them and ask them for their forgiveness. Um, I would see if there is some other kind of ceremony that you might be able to take part in that doesn't actually doesn't use psychedelics where you can ask for forgiveness. Uh, I, hey, you could you could try medicine, I guess. You could try pharmaceuticals maybe, but I really don't think, especially because of how the issues developed that that's really the solution. <sighs> Social responsibility. I know people want to promote these plants and these, these substances. I, I know firsthand the good that it can do, but 
no matter how much uh, I want to promote this, I have the social responsibility to my friends, to the viewers out there, to, to everyone, to warn them of the risks. I... Now, I know by openly admitting to the fact that uh, these psychedelics could either damage or kill you that I'm giving the opposition ammo, but people's lives and safety are more important than, to me than the movement. I would like to see psychedelics promoted, but I'd also, I also value human life more. It's easy to get excited about it. It's easy to get caught up in it, especially after a first few, you know, positive, pleasant experiences with it. But I've read so many accounts of people who have a positive first run with ayahuasca, and a second, and a third, and uh, the, the, the further they go, it all seems to come back to, you know, uh, uh, just pushing the envelope, and they go too far. Now you have to realize, especially with these sacred plants, that a plant, you will, you will never, from one batch to the next, find a plant that has the exact same potency, chemical composition, as it did out of the last batch. The chemical concentrations of these alkaloids in the plant fluctuate through a yearly cycle. It depends on what soil it's growing in, how much light it's getting, if it's growing next to a water source. Uh, what time of the year it's being harvested. Toxins in the air, for fuck's sakes. It, it, like, it, the, the alcohol level in these plants is continuously fluctuating. Like, and drastically. It's, it's not, it's not subtle. This stuff can be really dangerous. This stuff can do a lot of damage. You have to first know that you have the kind of mind that's designed to handle these experiences. Or you're gonna end up in the loony bin, tied to a bed. You have to read, you have to research, you have to study, you have to have patience. You... You have to have the patience to to know what you're doing before you get into it. To take the time, you know, hey, anyone can order these plants off of offline. But once you get it, you don't just, as the day it arrives in the mail, you don't just down it. You've, you've got to do allergy tests. You've got to do test doses. Uh, just to see, you know, hey, just to check and see, okay, I've done this plant before, but this is a different batch, so I'm going to do a little test dose to see how strong it is compared to, to what I've done before. You don't just get a ba new bag from a different batch and eat just as much as you did the last time. These are not party drugs. These are living things grown in the ground, and you know what? That nature does whatever the hell it wants to. So, to recap, I guess. Psychedelic exploration is not for everyone. I'm sorry. I'd really love to tell you that it is, but it isn't. Not everyone's mind is, is, is open to this experience. Anyone who wants to can take these plants and go to the other side. They can cross over. But whether or not they'll be able to handle that information overload when they get there or not, that's another question. And then, hey, even after you've discovered that you can handle crossing over, you can ha handle the experience then you have to have the self-control to somewhat remain rooted in the living world. 
I've crossed over before and gotten so lost on the other side that I lost any memory of my flesh self. I forgot I, I forgot I had a name, a body that I that I ever existed in this place. And I was so close to getting lost there forever, lost in the awe of it all, that I came very close to not coming back. But then this little itch starts in the back of your mind. This little itch, this little scratch, and then it grows and grows and grows, flickers into a spark, and then that spark becomes a memory. And then that memory leads you to different little flashes and impulses of, of what it was to be here, what it was to be human and be alive. And, I, you know, the first time it ever happened to me where I almost completely lost myself on the other side and got lost in awe, you know what the first fully formed memory of human life, of physical existence, it was that snapped me back and saved me? <laughs> the first fully formed idea that popped into my head and made me remember that I was once alive and that I actually wanted to come back here was coffee. I know it's not some big, huge revelation, but no, it was coffee. I just thought to myself, it's like, oh... If I stay here, you know, I'm really gonna miss coffee. I love a good cup of coffee. And that thought is what got me remembering more and more of myself. And then finally got me to the point where I was like, no, oh, okay, yeah. Sorry guys, I, uh, I gotta tap out, but I can't stay here. I wanna go back to my life. Um, you know, hey, I'm having a lot of fun here on the other side. It's beautiful, but I really want to finish this run at physical life. So, hey. <laughs> Some people aren't going to have those thoughts. Aren't going to have those little anchors to life. And they might not come back. Psychedelics are not for everyone. Shamanism, as much as it has been promoted and, and romanticized in the last few years, is, is not an entirely pleasant experience. It's a very selfless profession. You have to sacrifice a lot of yourself, give up a lot of yourself and your time to other people's needs. And there are a few more qualifications to being a shaman than just getting high. And on the social responsibility end of things, even as I make these videos, I, I, I try to I try to engineer my videos in such a way I always try to keep in the back of my mind that there are some people out there who are very, fairly weak minded and they'll follow along with whatever you say I have to consider that I have to make allowances for, for folks like that I have to make allowances for the fact that there might be out that somebody out there who will just follow along with whatever I say whatever I do and I have to issue the warnings I don't like to speak negatively of psychedelics, but because there are impressionable people out there, I have to. Uh, I know it sucks, and I hate to be the adult here, but if this is something you really are interested in, if this is something you really feel drawn towards or, or, or feel a calling to, you'll take the time, you'll have the patience to do the reading, to do the research, to know what you're getting into. And also, too, we have the social responsibility to do these plants responsibly, to practice what we practice responsibly, so that future generations have this opportunity as well. If we're careless with it, they'll outlaw it, and they'll bury it, and 
it'll be lost forever. Well, well, I'm gonna go have something to eat. Oh, cool. Check this out. Up in the Canadian North. And we got foxes running around camp. Oh! He's out sniffing for food. Because people have been feeding him. Because they're cute and they're cuddly. Which really sucks for Mr. Fox. Because... Now he's become dependent on that. But, oh my god, they are cute. And... He's right outside my truck now. Oh, ready to go. <laughs> there. Well, uh end our video off with a little bit of Canadian North, a little bit of nature there. I don't know, maybe the fox, maybe that's our totem for this video. <sighs> but if you guys are, you know, folks listening or watching, or I don't know if you find your way to this video, and you find yourself in the position where you might have been uh, one of these people who, who got into this and, and kind of went a little too far and even after coming back things don't seem right I that's that's my advice to you if you're feeling kind of damaged from one of these experiences if life's lost its luster a little bit if you've got residual effects hanging around uh, that would be my first course of action I would make an offering up to the spirits on the other side and ask them for their forgiveness um, if that doesn't work, uh, I'm not sure where you live. Uh, if you're in Canada or, in, or the States, I'd find your local First Nations uh, reservation. Go to that. Go to their healer. Tell them your problem. Tell them what's happened, and and see if there is some kind of uh, purification ceremony or something they might be able to take you through. I don't know. But, I'm going to bed now, so, uh, peace.